of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we're here in the studio today with Charlene Arnett and Dr. Faisal Suba from Monta Vista Hospital. For those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we come together on Thursdays at 10 o'clock and we bring together leaders of the healthcare industry right here in Las Vegas. Those that are doing innovative things, those that are t- touching on uh, medical travelers, and just improving the quality of health right here in Southern Nevada. You could catch us live on Facebook. You could see us after the uh, show on YouTube. And you could always send your questions in if you'd like. If you want to send questions in, you're going to go to VegasVideoNetwork.com slash live. You could uh, send us a text. We'll try to get to our guests with that question. Uh, in the meantime, welcome to the studio. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. So let's kind of just jump in a little bit. Uh, I want to touch on Monta Vista Hospital. That's obviously the reason that we're here. But we're here really to talk about behavioral health, mental health. It's a big problem right now. What's causing that? Well, it's not new. It's um, more open, openly discussed than it used to be. But people have had mental health issues always. But it was something to be ashamed of because it was something, you know, you're just not right uh, kind of thing. Not that this is an actual illness that's rooted in brain chemistry and something out of your control. So nowadays people are just, we're acknowledging it. We're a little bit more socially open to it. Right. And um, it's striking people that um, work every day. Absolutely. You know, is it's people that you would consider either affluent or certainly uh, Americans that held job every day. They pay taxes. They take care of their family. And things happen because not everybody is uh, schizophrenic, um, bipolar disorder, things like that. Um, those are chronic mental illnesses that, you know, have chemistry issues. Part of it is trauma. It's traumatic illness. Um, Something horrible happened to you or to someone you love, and you cannot wrap your brain around it. So it has the, I think there's more awareness that anybody can come into play and have a need for support for mental health. Doctor, one out of five Americans is touched by mental health. I know, um, you know, to touch a little bit on what Charlene was saying, she's, she's absolutely uh, correct. Um, you know, the stigma is, uh, is still there um, for, uh, for mental health, um, people who suffer from mental health. But I think that people are, are more willing now to actually go out and seek that, that help. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the social stressors that people have now like I, I talked to my dad, you know, like he uh, he grew up in New York, immigrant, came like uh, went through all these struggles in life, but he 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 just I, for some reason he had this uh, this drive and uh, and ability to um, to just accept certain things. A resilience. A resilience, mm-hmm. and that, and I think for some reason we're losing that resilience as uh, as generations progress. Part of what we want to do is um, we want to. I mean, we definitely as a psychiatrist, I know that the first thing that popped in people's mind, oh, he's a, he's a pill pusher. You know, like that's all. If I go and see him, all he wants to do is prescribe me medication. That's not what we do. That's not what, that's not what we want to do. That's not what we want to do at Monta Vista Hospital. That's not what I try to do in my private practice. Um, what we want to do is we want to try to incorporate this wraparound holistic approach to treating um, this individual. And everyone's an individual. Um, you know, I, I always hear, you know, like, uh, oh, doctor, what do I have? Right. What do I have? I do have, uh, give me, tell me what it is that's wrong with me. Give me a label. And, uh, you know, and labels. Can you fix it by tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and label, labels are great for insurance companies and billing, but labels are not great for, for the individual. Everyone is, a, is, is a, is a, is a person that has, may have a multitude of different things and through, medication management through therapy through other means that you know for instance like Monta Vista Hospital which is where we are it offers like this this whole array of different services that's how you treat the person that's how you you get to the root cause of uh, dealing with the with these uh, with these issues and these problems the so- thing about medication 
is it helps decrease some of the more disturbing symptoms you're having, mm-hmm. but it doesn't address why you're having them. Yeah. So That's, it's a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid. It just settles things down where maybe you can uh, clear up your thinking because you've got to look inside and with your therapist, with your doctor, and it's like, why are you feeling this way? What What is the underlying cause, root cause of that? And what can we help you uh, do to develop coping mechanisms to control those feelings or get rid of those feelings? Yeah, I think with, so therapy is very important. Sure. I think with medications, it gets you to that point where you can actually go and, and sit with a therapist, sit with uh, you know, somebody who maybe knows EMDR or other modes of, of therapy that can, that can, you know, you can get to the root cause of what's going on, like Charlotte so, was saying. I'd like to go back to a comment that you made, Doctor, about it being somewhat generational. So there's statistics out there that show that children from, I believe it's 18 to 25, are twice likely to have some type of challenge than those over 50. What's the cause of that? Is that just the, and I hate to label them, the entitlement <laughs> generation? Uh, is that What is that cause? Do we know? Well, there's a lot of theories. I mean, there's there's so many different things. And and then one of the things I mean you have to think about is uh, are we catching it more now than we were before? I mean, was it present before also, and we yeah. just weren't? I mean, maybe it just people weren't. It's just, more acceptable it's now. More acceptable to now get treatment to go. for your kid. Or so the attitudes yeah. have changed, attitudes. and we've accepted the fact that maybe little Johnny needs to see somebody. It no. could it could also again be related to this the the economic. Uh, um, the problems that people are having now in terms of you have to have like that two household income, mm-hmm. uh, maybe, you know, the daycare, the, you know, the, the stresses involved in raising children in today's society sure. with the social media and all the other things that are involved. I mean, there, there's so many different things. Times have changed since we all walked uphill barefoot to go to school. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And your mom stayed <laughs> home and, you know. It was, it was different back it was, then. It yeah. was different back then. Yeah. And, you know, nowadays, there's also a lot of pressure on kids. Um, part of the pressure comes from uh, us. Is, mm-hmm. It comes from parents who want not just more, because obviously um, the previous generation wanted great things for their kids, but the current gener- generation will, will actually pressure their kids. We want you to get in the best school. Yeah. You know, we want you to go to the Ivy League. You know, and there seems to be less kind of understanding that you may not be great at everything. And did we overcompensate with these participation medals? Sorry, oh, I'm just... I, call it, I call them the blue rib. <laughs> well, that's the ugly part of life is, you know, we want to give all the children a blue ribbon so they feel rewarded for yeah. having participated. And then we toss them in the deep end. I mean, because, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing is when you step into adult life, there are no more blue ribbons. That's right. You know, you have to actually perform. There's an expectation from you. And you don't get rewarded for just merely showing up. Yep. And uh, I think that is difficult uh, for young people you know, well, I think to that's deal with. probably a topic that we could put a whole show around. <laughs> but we're here today to talk yeah. about Monta Vista. Yeah. You guys have been around longer than any other hospital, and I hate, is it a hospital? And, and you've been around yeah. longer than anybody in Las Vegas. Yes, we're an acute care psychiatric facility. We're mm-hmm. licensed by the state of Nevada in um, CMS, you know, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. We're mm-hmm. Joint Commission accredited. Uh, we provided, we're the oldest and longest, uh, you know, producing psychiatric facility in the Las Vegas Valley. Like what, 34 years? or 34, 30? yeah, 34 years. That's quite an accomplishment. Not many people have been here for 34 years. I mean, maybe have had multiple owners, but have always been in business providing psychiatric services. We have 202 beds. We all, we're the only facility in the Valley that literally offers every level of psychiatric services that you could potentially need for all age categories, psychiatric and chemical dependency, we have long-term uh, treatment for adolescents. We have a psychiatric residential treatment facility. 
And as part of that, we have Monta Vista Academy. We're an accredited school with the Clark County School District. Wow. And, in fact, we're recognized by the uh, education department in the state as one of the best <laughs> schools. Who would have thought? In the state. That's it's actually great. at the psychiatric hospital. And we pride ourselves on helping our adolescents get back on track where they can uh, go back to school and enter at their appropriate class level. Because many of the kids we get, they have had lots of problems, and they're far behind Mm -hmm. in getting their credits. And so our goal is is to try to put them in the position where they can graduate from high school. And you've got inpatient and outpatient programs. We have inpatient, outpatient. uh, We we also have an ECT program. Um, so what does, what's an ECT? So uh, electroconvulsive therapy. It's basically okay. it's like shock therapy. Okay. Um, so I know when I say that, I mean the first thing that it's like people go the, cuckoo's nest. Yeah, <laughs> like, oh my god, that's, that's barbaric that's like... and this and that. But actually, it's it's a very effective tr- uh, mode of treatment for people that that have like s- uh, severe severe uh, uh, treatment resistant type illnesses. Um, like in terms of medication, they're they're, med- they're resistant to medications. Sure. Um, we it's actually a, a very effective treatment modality for uh, pregnant women um, and also in the elderly, and uh, it's not done like it was it, like what you would see in a in a mo- in the movies. Um, it's it's uh, it's an outpatient procedure. It doesn't take very long. Uh, you know, in and out maybe in about thirty forty minutes. Um, They're given anesthesia. Yeah, it's a very sure. brief form of anesthesia, and and the. Uh, People do very well. I mean, it's, it's something that even I was, when I was first learning about it, I was like, oh my God, it's like, uh, is this really something? But in reality, when I saw the results, and I and I went to Duke um, for like a mini fellowship in ECT, and, and all of our doctors actually that do the ECT uh-huh. did that. Um, and when you see the before and the after, it's uh, it's remarkable. The quality of life yeah. change. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not done lightly unadvisedly Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a screening process and you're really looking at patients that they've tried every everything medication all the medication cognitive behavioral therapy and nothing has worked for them and they are no longer functional in their life this is the person who doesn't get out of bed wow so we're going to touch a little bit on your workforce and things that you're doing to become this center of excellence. Mm-hmm. You recently got recognized as a recipient of the Southwest Alliance for Excellence Award. Right. Tell me a little bit about that and how that ties into the Baldridge Award, because that's a lot of folks in this market are not familiar with what it requires to be recognized the way that you have. Well, Baldridge is a it's basically a, a business award for quality. Uh, it's not just for healthcare. It's airline industry, businesses. Uh, they have many facets to it. Uh, in order to actually apply for the Baldridge Award, you must win the award in your community. And the Southwest Alliance is Nevada, Arizona, Utah. It's multiple states that mm-hmm. are part of that group. And so we took the first step uh, last year by going for survey and and they actually come out and survey your facility. And they have an entire listing of things they're looking at that is, establishes quality, mm-hmm. not just the things that Joint Commission or CMS or the government looks at. It, it's how do you actually handle your business, too. And, um, you know, so we're on the first step in the journey. We've gotten the first mm-hmm. award. Um, part of our um Directors in the hospital or evaluators have now been trained as evaluators for SHUA, for the Southwest Alliance. We go in with teams and evaluate other facilities um, in regards to these, you know, because that's one way for us to learn more, too, is when you're constantly in touch with it, looking at it, and seeing how other people achieve that goal. Because maybe they're doing it better than you. Mm -hmm. So how can we learn from that? But we think it's something that improves us overall as an organization and makes sure that we're looking at what is important. How do we deliver the best quality care to our patients? Well, kudos to y'all, because I'm not aware of any other healthcare organizations locally that have won a Baldridge uh, mm-hmm. Award. So to start that journey, it's a big step forward. So kudos to y'all. Thank you. So we talked a little bit earlier that you work with patients that have experienced trauma. Mm-hmm. 
you specialize a little bit in that area, and, and some folks don't know what that means. Can you take a little bit of time to uh, help our, 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 our watchers, our users, our, our, the folks that are, are, are watching the show right now, understand PTSD, things that you're doing to treat those that have experienced some level of trauma in their lives? So, so PTSD is, um, is, is actually it's, uh, it's a very severe um, type of situation. Um, it's not like, you know, a lot of us, all of us have trauma in our lives. All of us can suffer from, uh, from difficulties and, and seeing things or hearing things that are very difficult for us to comprehend and understand. PTSD, though, it takes it to a whole new level. I mean, you're, you're experiencing vivid uh, nightmares um, that are waking you up at night and you're, you're like panting and sweating and your heart is racing. Um, sometimes, you know, with these, with Vietnam, uh, uh, war veterans um, whom we worked with, uh, they are, they'll wake up and they'll actually be hitting or or trying to like uh, attack their their uh, their significant other um, in bed with them. Um, they'll they'll be in a situation like this and they might hear a sound uh, outside, like a helicopter or, uh, or a siren or or some loud bang, and all of a sudden they'll start reliving and re-experiencing whatever the trauma was that that occurred rape victims and people who have been molested um these are all people also that are prone to dealing with you know these types of symptoms it's it's very hard to treat it's a very difficult uh condition to live with so Monte Vista hospital took it to the next level where they opened up this uh, trauma center and uh they have they we're 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 really trying to explore all uh different um uh, treatment modalities that have been um, shown to be effective mm -hmm. in um, in studies and things of that nature. We're 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 doing the medications. We're doing the therapy. We're doing uh, this EMDR uh, treatment, which is this eye movement uh, desensitization type technique that or, that uh, certain therapists have to go to training for uh, and take special classes for to be able to administer. Um, we're doing. We're trying to do holistic. Uh, type uh, approaches as well. Um, anything and everything that, that is uh, an evidence-based medicine, we're trying to do to be at the uh, cutting edge of treatment for, for victims of trauma. Yeah. And, and all trauma, and not just, I mean, we're, we're, we're with the military, but also with, with uh, people who have experienced things like, you know, seeing their child die in front of them. Yeah, most relate PTSD to military, and it's not just that. It's not no. just that, yeah. Well, That's it's the shooting. Uh, the shooting on October 1. Yeah. October 1. Yeah. Um, you know, we come in contact with people that uh, it's that, well, why did I live? You know, you're standing there, and your best friend died next to you. Mm -hmm. You know, and a stranger died on the other side. It's like, why did I live? And you go to sleep at night, and you're waking up uh, hearing the gunshots. Yeah. And... Um, you uh, find yourself um, stopping periodically during the day and having to go back and have a cry. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's impeding your ability to function because you cannot get yourself wrapped around, your brain wrapped around. Yeah. I guess I first really became aware of PTSD. I was in Oklahoma City when it was with the bombing. Sure. And that was my, and I was over a psychiatric facility and and that's uh, when I learned that um, you didn't have to have been at the building to be traumatized by what occurred. You could have uh, lost a family member. You could have watched it on TV, uh, it going up and them carrying the bodies out for a week. Um, you know, that, and, and, or this just happening in your hometown where you felt safe and middle America had never been struck like that. Yeah. So it can happen, you know, a, a lot of things can occur and um, you don't know what event is just going to be so overwhelming that your brain has trouble processing this and being able to compartmentalize it and say, okay, that happened, but you know, I'm going to go on now. Some people are really greatly resilient. They have great coping skills. That's Others, a, it's it's traumatic. Yeah, that's a big issue. Mm -hmm. And it's probably as big as our, let's use the opioid crisis, and yeah. let's talk about addiction services and what you all do in that 
area. We know it's a, it's a, a crisis mm-hmm. and there's a lot of facilities in Las Vegas that are taking this on. You all are taking it on in a big way. What sets you apart from those other facilities when it comes to addiction services and to substance abuse and how you treat that? So what, you know, the statistics are staggering. I mean, it's like over like, I think it's like 115 people die every day you know from uh from opiate overdose um it's uh it's something that needs to be addressed and um you know the the state legislature has addressed it to a certain degree with by enacting some laws that are making it harder um for people to get access to prescription opiates but at the same time i mean that's not it's not this doesn't end there i mean the main the main issue is that it's so rapidly available on the street yeah. And then a lot of these patients now, about they can't get the opiate pain medicine, so now they're going out and they're getting a hold of the heroin or mm. uh, fentanyl or, or whatever it is that they can get on the street to get high. Um, and it's important to remember that just because you're addicted to substances doesn't mean that you can't have a comorbid mental illness. Mm. You know, So a lot of these people are also those same people that didn't get the treatment for the mental health issues, and maybe they're hearing voices, or they're severely depressed, or they're very anxious, and they're going out, and they're, because they can't get the mental health treatment, they're going out and they're self-medicating themselves mm-hmm. with alcohol and opiates and these types of substances. Um, so a lot of times, you know, um, I, I teach uh, residents and medical students, um, and, uh, one of the first things I tell them, like, they're like, they, they come and they tell me, oh, this person is just a drug addict, you know? And I mean, it's, I'm like, wait, you know, hold on. Like, how did that happen? There's something like, behind it. Where, yeah. where did that come from? And yeah. what led them to become that? Um, and if we can address that, then maybe we can fix this uh, addiction problem or, or uh, you know, start to treat that addiction problem. What we've done at Monte Vista Hospital is um, we've, we've enacted... Uh, state-of-the-art protocols um, in terms of uh, detox and then we have the ability to do the rehab and um, and uh, we have uh, extensive groups and therapy that are there again we try to use um, evidence-based medicine and guidelines from SAMHSA which is the, the substance abuse um, like the, those are like the gurus of substance abuse treatment mm-hmm. right so we try to use um, those types of methodologies in order to treat these patients and we've seen results. I mean, it, we we also then can transition them from the inpatient program to our partial hospitalization program, and then we have an intensive outpatient program. So as long as they follow, and we have a large alumni group. Yeah. So you've we got that a, continuity of care yeah, that we, we all hear a, about. We we have a large alumni group that meets yeah. regularly uh, in order to support each other. Sure. Yeah, um, well, what we try to do is um, so like, like I have. Uh, a large uh, psychiatry group in town called Alliance Mental Health Specialists. And we partner with uh, Monta Vista uh, a lot with their patients so that um, it's very hard to find an outpatient uh, appointment. So what we try to do is whenever someone is discharged from Monta Vista, we immediately try to incorporate them into our practice so yeah. that they can continue to get that uh, that service and treatment quickly and rapidly and efficiently. Yeah. Um, and that's the key. That's the key. Uh, one of the hardest things when a person is hosp- when discharged from a psychiatric facility, I think the, the statistics are like, like 25 to 50 percent of them actually show up to their outpatient appointment. Wow. They get lost. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because there's such a limited amount of outpatient providers. Yeah. And, and I saw that you all that. offer patient transportation, which oh, was yeah. very unique. Yeah, we do. We pick people up that want to attend partial hospital or intensive outpatient. Yeah. Uh, we have vans running, you know, eight vans run every day and go out into the community wow. and pick up adolescents and adults that are, you know, needing treatment. Um, it helps the families, you know. Uh, most of the families are based working people. Um, they, need, they need that assistance, and it's a very important— it's a big leap to be from an inpatient psychiatric facility to just put you on the street. Yeah. You know, you really need those intermediate steps of outpatient to kind of ease that transition. And the medication is great. It helps cushion the fall and get you off the med. But uh, 
you have to do, look at the underlying issues of why were you taking the medication to begin with. And that's what's unique about the opioid crisis is uh, it's a, a more affluent um, taxpayer addiction. Yeah. You know, m- many of the people with an uh, opioid addiction, this was a, a person who worked every day. They maintained their family. They had insurance. And some critical event occurred. They were hurt on the job. They were in an automobile accident. They s- sustained a... Uh, a, a devastating physical injury that it took them months to recover from. And in that process, they were placed on hydrocodone because they were in pain. Yeah. They were taking it for a legitimate reason. They didn't go into it to become a drug addict. Yeah. That was a, you know, that was like, oh my God. Yeah. And, you know, families are wonderful. They're very supportive when you get hurt. But at some point that you hear those words, those words that I really like the least, and it's like, well, when are you going to get over it? Mm. You need to get over it. They need you back to work. They need you back supporting the family. And in this process, you still have pain. You you know, your problem wasn't necessarily cured. It may have been minimized, but you still get up every day and you have pain. And you have become addicted to what has been prescribed for you for that pain. And I don't think in the beginning anyone really understood how addictive hydrocodone was. Because they say, I've read a few weeks ago, that you can actually become addicted by taking it for like a week. Wow. You know, you don't have to be on it for months. And, uh, you know, I think it was in... uh, 2013, the federal government started really becoming aware of uh, how many were addicted, how many people were dying, and they uh, increased the schedule of it. Um, There are certain prescription medications that you have to do in duplicate forms, and it's reported to the DEA that you're prescribing Mm -hmm. this stuff, and they increased the schedule number on hydrocodone. And that's when everybody said, well, wait a minute. We need to stop ordering so much of that. Mm-hmm. Well, unfortunately, you already had addicted this part of the population. Yeah. Yep. You know? And so as we're looking at it, it's not enough that we give them Suboxone and help them come off the drug. We, we then have to help them with these underlying issues, whether it's a mental health issue or it's a physical health issue. We have a yoga instructor come in. We have... Um, pet therapy, we try to look at what are the holi- what's the holistic approach that we can use. Well, I know we need more time. The show's coming close to an end. And before we get off, I do want to commend you guys, uh, Monta Vista, for all of your work in the community. Uh, you all are very active members of the Chamber of Commerce, which we're thankful for. That's the business community. Uh, and I know they're very grateful for that. At the same time, you, I heard you do quite a bit of work with the Clark County School District. Absolutely. Uh, th- that's critical to, to take care of our youth. They're our future. Well, on any uh, given day, we have probably at least 80 or 90 kids on our property. Oh, my. We do children and yeah. adolescents. And at the same time, our vets. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I saw that you work with the, the Veterans Association and the, yeah. the Veterans Home here in town. So thank you for all of that. We appreciate uh, we, that's, that's big. Anyway, we've got to bring the show to a close again. I think we've got a lot more to talk about. We could probably do whole subjects <laughs> on some of this. But uh, thanks for coming into the studio. We appreciate uh, you sharing your story. And I'm sure our, our viewers had a lot to learn from that. And if viewers wanted to get hold of you, how do they do that? Well, Monta Vista Hospital is located at 5900 Rochelle Avenue. Um, The closest cross street would be Johnson Flamingo. Our phone number is 702-364-1111. We also have uh, a website. You can go on our website, and we have a lot of information for you and how to uh, come in contact. And the one thing to remember is, you know, our admission department is really admission and referral. We, you can come and just talk to us. Not everybody gets admitted that comes to Monta Vista because we take uh, locking you up <laughs> really seriously. Yeah. 
you know, uh, we're not going to take away your rights and lock you in a psych hospital unless we're fearful that your life is in danger, whether it's from self-imposed or somebody else's life is in danger. Okay. So you can come and just talk to us, and we'll find somebody. We refer a lot. We, we make sure we know everybody in the community that does anything uh, to help the mentally ill and we'll refer you to a service that can help you. We never want you to leave empty-handed. Thank you both for coming to join us today. It. And uh, for those uh, viewers that are with us today, thank you for uh, taking part of your day to join us. And we look forward to seeing you next week for another edition of Inside Medicine. Make it a great day.